Okay, so our next uh, speaker is uh, Shadi uh, Daya here locally here at UC San Diego. And he'll be telling us about uh, this high density um, microelectrode arrays, right, for, um, uh, and, and what it tells us about how the brain works. So, Shadi. All right, well, thank you very much uh, for the introduction and for including me in this uh, great symposium. Um, my uh, lab at UCSD uh, leverages advanced semiconductor device processing in order to develop and deploy neurotechnologies that, uh, with an attempt basically to bridge the gap between high resolution and large scale coverage, uh, to be able to understand how the small potential fluctuations on the individual cellular level coordinate a large scale function over extended regions uh, of the brain. Now, to do that, we use a number of devices, uh, including uh, intracellular nanowire arrays in a fishbone architecture uh, that um, um, have potential to measure intracellular uh, uh, recordings from extended neuronal networks in intact brains. We also work on uh, penetrating uh, microelectrode arrays with a flexible backing uh, that are also scalable to thousands of channels. And we also work on ECOG devices uh, with large scale coverage. And, and all of these devices are human compatible. So perhaps this device is the minimally destructive or least invasive device that, that we use on the lab, and we will be focusing today on recordings done with these ECOG uh, devices. Now, in the last uh, two years, we've uh, seen a, a number of developments in the field where recordings with th thousands of channels has been demonstrated in rodent animals. Uh, um, there is a remarkable work came out from Lauren Frank's uh, lab at UCSF, uh, where they demonstrated recordings with polymer electrodes that were placed on silicon hardened shanks and um, uh, recorded over extended durations of time, and more recently the work that came out uh, from Neuralink. But um, for clinically viable devices, um, uh, the most impressive advances uh, came out from uh, Eddie Chang's lab at UCSF, where he uses epilepsy-type grids, such as those that are uh, shown over here, to record neural activity and use decoders for this recorded activity correlated with the kinematics of the mouth movements in order to decode speech. Now, there are other labs working on this, including Nathan Crone's lab at, at Johns Hopkins. Now, the most advanced clinical electrode um, contains about 256 channels. This is an attack electrode, uh, 16 by 16 channels uh, with four millimeter spacing, a diameter of about one millimeter, and this is extending over a large uh, cortical area of 6.4 centimeters by, by 6.4 centimeters. But this clearly undersample uh, neuronal function. So if you want to uh, include higher channel count, we would want to reduce the diameter and bring these electrodes closer together. And when we do that, the impedances of these electrodes increase, and therefore the recording quality is compromised. What we are uh, doing at UCSD is using uh, highly electrochemically sensitive uh, electrode materials that I will talk about today on uh, very thin substrates, so these are 10 micrometer thick, and uh, they'd allow us to record in a 1024 capability over an area of 3.2 centimeters by 3.2 centimeters when we have a one millimeter uh, spacing between the contacts. Diameters are variable, could be 20 microns. Conveniently, we use 50 to 100 micron usually. And this has a long extender so that we have clear coverage between the electrode being placed on the cortical surface and the recording electronics that has to be cleared out from the surgical field. Now, being thin is very important because uh, we want these electrodes to be compliant to the brain movement and to maintain the conformality on the surface of the cortex so that we have excellent coupling of neural activity to these electrodes. So uh, today I'll uh, start by talking about why do we need low contact impedance electrodes and how do we make them. I'll uh, focus on a new electrode material that's developed in our lab, the platinum nanorods, and uh, uh, describe its electrochemical properties. 
and then I'll uh, uh, show results about their use uh, during intraoperative monitoring across multiple clinical centers uh, in epilepsy monitoring, some language tasks, and uh, more recently in, in motor mapping. So like in any engineering problem, um, we all know that surfaces and interfaces actually determine uh, how the system performs. And um, most conventionally, the electrode material that uh, has been used in neural interfaces um, include P-dot PSS. We've heard the previous speaker, Ricky, talk about electroplating P-dot PSS on the electrode to lower the electrode impedance. And this is a one-dimensional polymer that has gaps in between the polymer chains and that allows ions to intercalate into the polymer material and participate in the charge transfer. So it gives, us, gives it the characteristic of volume sensing as opposed to surface sensing. Rough electrodes has been uh, also used, in, including sputtered iridium oxide films, and those typically give uh, low impedances. Impedance depends on diameter and we'll describe that in, in a couple of slides. Now, but what really determines how good a material can be for electrochemical sensing could be inferred from this volcano plot that electrochemists use. This is uh, looking at the exchange current, which is the equilibrium, zero potential current, across the electrode material in solution as a function of the bond length. If we have a small bond length between the ion and the surface of the electrode, that means the residence time of the ion on the surface of the electrode is short. So you don't have enough time to participate in a charge transfer, and the currents are usually small. If we have a large bond length, that means the residence time is long, so we can have one charge transfer, but we block the site so that no additional ions come and participate in this uh, charge exchange. So we need just the right amount of energy for ions to come sit on the electrode, participate in a charge exchange, and then clear the way for other ions to come and be sensed. And that's why platinum is one of the best catalytic materials that we use uh, in catalysis, electrochemical catalysis. Now, if we want to uh, look further at why impedance really matters for recording. This can be inferred uh, from the plot that we see right here. This is using planar platinum electrodes. We're looking at the noise voltage as a function of frequency. And for uh, different diameters, we go from one millimeter to 20 microns. We notice that the one over F noise increases by a factor of about D squared as we reduce the diameter of, of the electrode. If you use a low impedance material such as P-dot or platinum nanorod, even though we go across these multiple scales, the uh, 1 over F noise is constant because we have a lot of adsorption sites. So the random motion of ions in the vicinity of the contact does not induce a lot of noise. Now, an additional uh, consideration for the thin electrodes that we use is that um, uh, there is a thin insulation layer between the metal leads on the electrode and the surface of the brain. About two microns usually to 10 microns. And therefore, we have a large parasitic capacitance between these metal leads and the surface of the brain. And this large parasitic capacitance can short the input of the amplifier. So if we have a high impedance electrode and a low input impedance to the amplifier, most of the voltage drop that we're seeing at the contact will be dropped across the electrode itself. So in order to mitigate this effect, we need to really reduce the electrode impedance and to uh, preserve the strength of the neural signal that we're recording. So how do we make these you know, one-dimensional platinum nanorods on flexible substrates? Usually to make one-dimensional structures, we need to use um, high temperature processes, but flexible substrates have a low thermal budget maximum about 170 degrees C in the case of perylene, case of polyimids about 300 degrees C. So we use something called the selective uh, de-alloying or a selective dissolution of materials. We deposit, uh, could deposit two materials together, silver and platinum, and we put it in a solution which, is select, which can selectively etch silver, silver versus platinum. And as this process continues, the, for surface energy minimization, silver comes out of the alloy to the surface and gets etched by the nitric acid in this case. Now, 
most conveniently we get this nanoporous structure, but if we tune the deposition conditions, we uh, uh, could get the remain, remaining platinum structures to be in the form of cylindrical rods. So this is what we are referring as uh, platinum nanorods. They're uh, 400 nanometer tall and about 50 to 100 nanometer in their diameter. Now, if you look at a, uh, a slightly larger field of view image of, of what a single microelectrode contact looks like, uh, this is shown here. It's a 50 micron diameter contact. And you can see that there is a recession inside the contact. So if we, look, if we take a line cut and we look in the cross-section of the contact, we see that the rods are actually at the bottom of a mesa. And this mesa is formed by uh, Paraline. So what touches the cortical surface is actually the surface of the paraline, and there will be no shear forces on the rods to, to break them out. So this is important for their mechanical stability. Now, if you look a little bit uh, closer in the transmission electron microscope, uh, we see that these devices are built on paraline with a thin adhesion layer, a platinum base, and the rods themselves are porous so that you have a slightly larger surface uh, area to volume ratio. And if we look even closer, we see that uh, there are a lot of these sharp facets. And these facets induce charged dipoles that usually lower the work function and enhance the electrochemical activity. So it's not only a gain in the surface area, but it's also a gain in the electrochemical interaction itself. Now, if you look at the impedance at uh, two different frequencies here, 10 hertz, 1 kilohertz, as a function of diameter, for platinum, which is yellow, it's the highest impedance. Platinum nanorod is the green, which is the lowest impedance for all diameters. And then P dot PSS is comparable in its impedance to that of, of platinum. Now, and the values for uh, different you know, diameters are shown over here. At 1 kilohertz, you get about 20 kilo ohms for uh, 24 kilo ohms for a 40 micron diameter contact. Um, and that's for P dot, for uh, platinum nanorod, it's about 25 kilo ohms. And for planar platinum, it's about 200 kilo ohms. So about an order of magnitude or so lower than planar uh, platinum contacts. Now, this is important uh, also for stimulation. If we inject the same charge across both electrodes, platinum nanorod and platinum, we can see that we build a smaller uh, transient voltage across the platinum nanorod compared to that of platinum. Therefore, it's safer to inject charges with these low impedance electrodes compared to uh, the planar metal electrodes because we would have more room to inject more charges before we reach the water hydrolysis window. Right? And this is quantified with the charge injection capacity, the amount of safe charge that we can inject per unit area. And it's about 16 times higher for platinum nanorods compared to the planar platinum. And this is at small diameters. And as you go to large diameters, this effect uh, fades away. So in the uh, remainder of the talk, I'll show uh, uh, some intraoperative results done with both P dot and platinum nanorods. This work is done at uh, Mass General Hospital with, in collaboration with the, the group of Sydney Cash. And we see a bipolar electrode uh, that's being used for disruption of function, for electrical stimulation and disruption of function. Our electrodes are uh, placed right here. There is uh, video tracking of the location of the uh, stimulating electrode with respect to the microelectrodes so that we can correlate the, uh, the effect of, of, of distance stimulation while we are recording uh, potentials on, on the microelectrodes. Here we're using a, uh, a small pitch uh, arrays with 50 micron side-to-side uh, -side spacing in two columns, 128 in, in total. And so this is relatively where the simulation is with respect to the recording array. And we can see from the cumulative uh, plot from all channels that at about one and a half seconds into the recording, we see an uh, eruption of uh, um, of waves of local field potentials. If we plot that uh, spatially on the, on the two grids, we see that the wave propagates uh, closer to the stimulation site up to the top of the array. There is changes not only in the temporal uh, signature of these waves, but also in their, in their amplitude on distances of about 100 to 200 microns. 
This is used also in uh, some of the epilepsy cases where uh, the arrays are placed uh, in between or next to clinical electrodes. Uh, so we see that uh, when we record uh, uh, interictal uh, epilepsy discharges on the clinical electrodes, which uh, are shown over here, we can also record them on the research electrodes. These are 128 channels, uh, four banks uh, of 32 channels. Now here the activity is a little bit faster, so it's a little bit harder to see the propagation of wave. Uh, but what we can see from the color coding is that um, at one side of the electrode array, one side of the electrode array, we have uh, larger potentials as the wave propagates. To the other side, we have smaller potentials, and there is a little bit of delay in the maximum peak of, of these waves. Now, in uh, some of the language tasks, first, uh, the uh, localization of different um, uh, brain regions is done with a conventional uh, epilepsy grid. And then once we know, or once uh, the uh, neurosurgeons know exactly where's the superior temporal gyrus, for example, uh, which processes language versus other brain regions, we place our microelectrode arrays just over that region. And um, what we're looking at here is the high gamma activity from about 60 trials. Uh, on, um, on the y-axis, we have the distance across the um, um, array, the two-column array. This is as a function of time. And the responses here are uh, being measured when the patient is listening to auditory stimuli. In some cases, they don't make any sense. Or for proper words, or just noise. And we can see that uh, when there are um, you know, letters that don't make sense or complete words, we have sharp responses where noise does not provide any response. And similarly, the regions that did not respond to the words have uh, some response in the noise and a little bit of response also in the words and nonsense. So we have basically oppositely responding regions for words nonsense compared to noise. But what's uh, remarkable here is that the transitions from the responsive regions to the non-responsive regions are relatively sharp on the order of few hundreds of microns. If we take a look here through line cuts through the averages of all of these trials, we can see that some of these transitions extend from 450 microns to about 250 uh, microns. And this work is done in collaboration with uh, Eric Halligren here at, at UCSD. Now we uh, move to recordings with the 1024 arrays. Uh, these could be configured in you know, tight pitch or in large coverage. We'll first start with the tight pitch. This is a 16 by 64 array. And um, the video right here shows the placement in, uh, at OHSU of, uh, of these arrays on the cortical surface of, of a patient undergoing a tumor resection. Now the electrode is transparent. Uh, so uh, you could see the anatomy of the brain while you are placing it, but it's also hard to handle because it's, it's very thin, and you can kind of see the electrode only when it reflects light uh, um, um, from the surface. Now this is Dan Cleary, a, a neurosurgery resident postdoc in my lab who is conducting the uh, awake uh, um, uh, uh, discussion with the uh, patient. Now, the electrode was uh, placed, in this case, over the Borca's area. And um, similar to the case of the 128 uh, channel arrays, we're looking at responses for nonsense uh, auditory stimuli, uh, stimuli with words or with noise. And uh, we can see uh, here as well that uh, regions that are responsive to the auditory stimuli are non-responsive in the uh, noise stimuli. There are Additionally, fragments or stripes of responsive regions in addition to a few individual units uh, that are responsive right here. So this is uh, giving us a, an early glimpse of the functional or organization of language processing uh, in the human brain. Now, about uh, two weeks ago, we had a, uh, our first case in which we've uh, done uh, motor mapping. Um, where uh, the patient the is finger. being instructed uh, to the middle finger together. move specific yep, you're fingers doing it. You're doing a great where job. we are tracking the movement. Okay, and 
time locking this movement to the recorded activity from the surface of the brain. For a few seconds. All right, so I'm going to show you in a second where uh, basically how the activity looks like, uh, but this is the placement of the electrode on, on the patient's brain. And um, there are um, still non-idealities. Uh, we can see that there are regions which have uh, CSF uh, bubbles underneath. Uh, so that prevent us from recording uniformly across the whole array. And these are things that we can overcome by creating perfusion holes to let the CSF come out uh, through the electrode. Now I'm uh, going to show you uh, a, a video about uh, uh, the type of activity that we see here uh, for trial averages of uh, 57 cycles of flexion and extension. And um, what we're going to see is basically a wave that propagates from the top left to the bottom right. And uh, we're going uh, to also see that the activity that you uh, see right here is uh, roughly um, showing a dipole or a source sink configuration with uh, a, a nearby region. So let's see. And uh, you can see first the negative uh, portion of the wave propagates. And then we'll see that you know, the yellow uh, higher potential also comes across the same, you know, path. And then in a second, you will uh, uh, see once more that, you know, the high potentials appear when the potential is low on this side and so on. This is a relatively new process just uh, yesterday. And we're very excited about, uh, about, about this result. Again, uh, looking at the trial averages for um, the uh, deflection uh, of the finger and then the recorded signal. Uh, we see consistent responses across all trials. Uh, what perhaps uh, you have noticed in the video is that the movement of the finger was uh, happening periodically after each other. So the times for each trial are varying between one trial and the other, which uh, basically complicates a little bit time locking of the phases between the two signals. Right, so I'd like to finish up by saying that we uh, just started using uh, these electrodes in uh, uh, assisting uh, 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 neurosurgery on, in the spinal cord where uh, uh, one needs to do neuromonitoring during uh, uh, removal of tumors in the spinal cord, for example. So we have uh, peripheral nerve stimulation recording the spinal cord or cortical stimulation and uh, recording in the uh, uh, spinal cord, transmission of, of the signals in the spinal cord. The uh, stimulation here is done at a uh, frequency of about 2.8 hertz in order to delineate the responses from any of the uh, signals that are in the environment. And we see from the recordings that that's, you know, after a little bit of time delay, that's what we record from the spinal cord. Um, what the significance of these results is that with clinical stimulation, typically one needs about 16 milliamps or so to induce activity and record it with the strip electrodes. But with the thin flexible electrodes, we can do that with about 2 milliamps. And the same is uh, true for the cortical stimulation. Now, this is a large collaboration effort, and um, I'm uh, uh, very lucky to have uh, excellent collaborators with uh, whom I um, interact uh, and supervise a number of students and postdocs, particularly Eric Halligren and uh, Sid Cash at MGH and Ahmed Reslan at uh, OHSU. The uh, team that has uh, contributed to the 1024 arrays is mainly Andrew Boris and, and Yongbin Chui. G1 is uh, uh, taking these advances and doing uh, penetrating laminars for uh, human use. On the spinal cord side, uh, Joe Sayasi and Sharona bin Haim are uh, the leads uh, on the medical side. So the work is uh, mainly supported by the NSF. We just received uh, support from the NIH. And um, uh, over the last five or six years, we've had several grants from uh, uh, the Center for Brain Activity Mapping here at UCSD that allowed me to, uh, uh, to develop these ideas together with my collaborators. So thanks for your attention. I'd be happy to take any questions. Actually, it was great. So going all the way from electrode materials to neuroscience and clinical, and clinical applications. Yeah. Some questions? Okay.
There we go. So uh, I was curious about the, um, uh, the geometry, the width and the thickness of the traces on your 1K array, and what was the uh, cable impedance over 10 centimeter length? Right, so the, uh, the width of, of the lead is about uh, five microns. Right now we're working with pitch is 10 microns. Impedance is, uh, well, the, the resistance is uh, about uh, three to 10 kilo ohms, depending on how, how far in the contacts. Usually the contact impedance is about 20 kilo ohms for 30 microns. So we're just lower than the contact impedance itself. Thank you. So I have a question. So um, this is amazing because um, uh, technologies here, right? So uh, I noticed on your um, uh, electrode impedances that um, you get usual, I guess, uh, dependence on, on area, uh, right? Uh, um, but for the nanorods, um, it seems that for larger areas, you didn't quite get the same advantages than for, uh, that you got for, for small areas. Could you? Explain yes, so, what happens. Yeah, so usually um, the, um, the impedance actually at micro scale is dictated by the circumference where edge effects are usually maximal. And as we go to larger contacts, these edge effects have lower of an influence. So, so we see the maximum benefits in platinum nanorods at smaller contacts where this edge's effect is really large and it decays as we go to larger contacts. And the reason over there is uh, mainly current crowding at the edge of the contact that contributes to a series resistance which scales with circumference. And this effect fades away as we go to larger contacts. So that suggests you may be better off having islands of electrodes rather than a solid uh, electrodes, right? Yes, we are exploring that for larger current carrying electrodes. Some more questions? Bruce. Well, I'm just curious. Um, you, you get all of these great surface recordings, but people who are recording from the surfaces of EEGs often think about source localization. Do you think of, at all about that? With how can, can, you, can you detect depth of signal under underneath your ray? Uh, can you focus up and down, so to speak? The, the, this is an uh, this is a golden question if we are able to to answer it, and we are trying to do that both in 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 animals and in humans. In animals, what we're trying to do is work with uh, colleagues who do two photon imaging, like Anna Devore in which we can uh, look, at, uh, look at the calcium signal during the activity and uh, correlate this calcium signal with the electrophysiology that we record from the surface of the brain to know exactly you know, where is the source of these signals. In, in humans, when there is uh, tumor resection, we're uh, looking at uh, stimulation subcortically and recording cortically to be able to map the, the eruption of activity due to stimulation. More questions? Well, with that, let's thank, thank Shadi again. Thank you.